Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the opportunity to sit down and chat with amazing humans about their journey with mental health. For this episode, I'm so happy to introduce Amy Huskisson to the conversation. Welcome, Amy. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's lovely to see you, albeit virtually, of course. Um, so for, for yeah, as I do on these uh, podcasts, just a brief introduction to how Amy and I know each other. And uh, then I'm going to let you do a proper introduction, Amy, let people know what you really do, who you are and so on. Uh, so as always with many of these, um, Amy and I haven't met in person, but we've met through social media, through LinkedIn. And we're both actually mental health first aid instructors. We both train the same programs with clients and corporates and, and groups. Um, and we're both very passionate about the subject. So uh, yeah, it's been great to sort of have a pre-conversation just to, to get sort of a bit of understanding of each other and how we work, but we're very similar, I think in many ways, which is, which is wonderful and brings us together to this podcast today. So Amy, welcome. Please do a proper introduction to who you are um, and what you do. Hello. Um, yeah, so as you say, my name is Amy Huskisson. Um, my background's in psychology. Um, so I have worked in psychological services for the past 14 years. Um, I started out, um, I suppose, as an undergrad. Um, I decided to take psychology because I didn't know what else to do. And I think that that's probably a lot of people's experience that start out within psychology. So um, I did well at A-levels um, in regards to my psychology A-level and found it very interesting and intriguing. Um, so I went on to do my undergrad at Nottingham Trent University. Um, and my journey started re really there where I kind of grew in my interests um, also saw my lecturers and really wanted to be them and I think um, you know putting myself in in their role really now where I'm kind of out and about delivering talks and lectures and um, you know training sessions as well um, but my journey from there really went into um, challenger behavior units so I was always really interested in supporting individuals who had learning disabilities or on the autistic spectrum and were in services. And um, so I moved into um, you know, learning disability um, units and also um, community mental health from a really young age, really, um, delivered um, you know, behavioral programs to support people in independent housing units. Um, and also support a kind of routine um, and uh, the delivery of, I suppose, augmented communication and augmented um, support planning for individuals who um, found it quite difficult to understand their um, support or their care. Um, because, as we know, um, even to this day, um, whilst we're getting better, you know, way back then, kind of 14 years ago, um, communication tools really were quite poor um, in community mental health settings for individuals who had learning needs and learning disabilities. Um, so that was a big part of my role. And I worked up within that um, mental health um, system, really became kind of a shift um, coordinator and supervisor. Um, and then got my first assistant psychologist post, um, which was in a specialised autism unit, um, both in the community and also in hospital as well. Right. I worked with individuals who um, were diagnosed with um, autistic um, spectrum disorder, um, who either had um, a coexisting diagnosis of mental ill health, um, or had a coexisting diagnosis of learning disabilities. Um, and largely I was in the learning disability um, community and inpatient settings um, due to my past experience. So I trained in kind of Makaton and sign along um, supporting individuals um, with that. Um, so which is an, you know, a very much taken from ambitious sign language, but it's you know, a simple communication tool. Um, and I, I was there for about 18 months and um, supported um, kind of the nurses to develop, to develop support plans, care plans, to provide people with a safe and structured environment um, where historically they may well not have had that or you know, their caregivers might have understandably found it very difficult um, to provide that as well. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of where that took me. <laughs> 
And within the community, so uh, working with individuals who have um, a higher functioning autism um, and who also had um, difficulties with their mental health. And so had diagnosis, say depression and anxiety, largely, but also with psychosis Um, and being able to deliver psychotherapy and individual psychological support. Um, but tailored to that individual. So we would work kind of person-centered holistically um, with the multidisciplinary team. So we'd work with occupational occupational therapy and speech and language therapy, again, to provide a consistent approach um, that, as I said, was person-centered, but where we could still deliver individual psychotherapy and people would benefit from it. Because going in, and delivering therapy to somebody who, you know, may well be on the autistic spectrum that didn't really understand concepts as what you were talking about, well, you're not really going to get much of a, um, you know, you're not going to get much success there. Um, So, yeah, and I was just, you know, fascinated, you know, every single day was um, a, you know, new learning day where I was able to kind of put my work into my, um, skills and knowledge from my university course into practice really I was so lucky and and privileged to work with such brilliant psychologists and speech and language therapists and you know occupational therapists where I felt like a bit of a magpie and I still do and I think wherever I go and whoever I work with um I always take you know knowledge from people skills from people resources from people um and then pass that on to everybody else and I think that is you know like yourself moving into the world of delivering training I like to use that information and that um, those anecdotes and those stories and those resources to support other people as well Um, and as I've said you know that is a very privileged position to be in and I still you know, you know, feel that way now and did, you know, did way back when. So, yeah, so I was just kind of presented with books and research and science. <clears throat> and I think still now, everything that I do, I really want it to be science and evidence based. Yeah. And so, again, you know, playing on my past experience and my past background and being able to draw on some of that and um, on some of that knowledge. And also knowing the people that I've worked with and the stories that I've heard is that you take those, you know, share that um, in a way that's obviously anonymous and confidential so that people understand and understand that, um, you know, from a real life perspective and what that might look like. Yeah. And, and then moving forward, um, I then moved back home because I moved away for my first um, assistant psychologist role. And then I moved into inpatient services. <clears throat> so I started to um, deliver individual and group psychotherapy and uh, for individuals who were in uh, low secure Um, or rehabilitation, locked rehabilitation units, who had diagnoses of mental ill health, um, some of which had a diagnosis of mental ill health and also had an offender background. Um, So individuals who had either been um, diverted from the court to um, fulfill their sentence in a hospital environment because it was or where somebody had been in prison, it was deemed relevant for them to come for a mental health assessment to see if the the prison environment was actually helping or hindering them and whether they would be more supported within that inpatient environment. And that really then took me on the journey of um, forensic mental health. Um, So I went back to university I then did my postgraduate in forensic um, psychology um, and spent kind of two years doing that work as well as uh, working alongside 
Um, and I think that that really, that part of my journey and knowledge around mental health um, grew to the extent that, you know, I was working there for eight years, I think. Um, so I was working with eight years. I worked with males and females. Um, as I've said, diagnosed with mental ill health, also diagnosed with personality disorder as well. So there was a, a sp specific unit for um, females who have been diagnosed with personality disorder. So a whole range of journeys and stories where I could understand the impact of trauma mm. and also the impact of early life experience in the real time and what that might look like. And I think from my perspective, lots of people that I knew and you know, family members um, didn't really understand why I wanted to do what I was doing because I was kind of in the nitty gritty, really supporting people alongside you know, um, the brilliant psychologists that I work with and again, multidisciplinary team. Yeah. Um, but it was upsetting and it was hard work. And people didn't really understand why I would put that myself in that position, but it was for those individuals and for their stories. And if I could be any part of their recovery journey, then that's all I needed because I saw the person behind the offence, say, if I was working yeah. with an individual who had offended. I saw the person behind the broken relationships and the difficulties in communicating with other people and the challenges that they may have present, uh, presented with because that was their armor. And I think that that is really one of my main goals in supporting people um, through their mental health journeys is being able to allow them to de-armor and talk to somebody yeah. or a group of people or a professional about it um, so that they can see that, or have the same hope for recovery that I had for every single individual that I worked with. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what I suppose has been, it is always a challenge, isn't it? That when you are poorly, when you have depression or anxiety, that you can't see a way out and you can't see that light at the end of the tunnel. And I very much hope that I can be that for somebody. Um, and I think that that is really why I keep going and I keep doing what I'm doing, because yeah. if I can help a handful of people or hundreds of people, um, it doesn't matter. It's about you know helping who I can and being able to portray that hope but as I've said, in regards to my own mental health journey, mm. I think working within that environment was very difficult. And this isn't this isn't something that is, you know, personal for me. You know, this was all the majority of the people that I worked with, you know, the support that was provided by the doctors, the psychiatrists, the nurses, um, you know, occupational therapy and the psychologists we all had the shared experience that every night I would say you would go home with a lot of baggage yeah um and for me personally I could only sustain that for so long and I think that I've seen that umpteen times throughout kind of my career working with many many brilliant and wonderful professionals that the sustainability of that without looking after yourself really well is very challenging yeah and uh, that kind of led me on to as part of my forensic psychologist training um one of our core competencies is delivering training so we have to show that we can um, deliver the training, that we can carry out a training needs analysis, et cetera, yep. and do that within the hospital environment. And straight away, when, when I thought about that core competency, was about, right, what kind of program can I deliver for the staff members that's going to help them with their own mental health? Um, because 
We would provide supervision, group supervision for the staff members that we worked with. And everyone was talking about the same thing, this vicarious trauma yeah. where you would go home with that. And it was very difficult to, um, to live your life at the weekend um, if you hadn't got these, you know, sk skills to be able to be resilient to that. Yeah, um, and it became a challenge kind of lifelong for people, but also a big part of the challenge for people's mental health working in this, those services was compassion fatigue. Because people supported people day in, day, you know, day out with trauma. And they would go home and they felt very emotionally disconnected from their families or their friends. And that was something that was the feedback that they got from their families and friends. And yeah. we would have conversations around that. And um, so I then started to develop the resilience training package um, that I delivered to the um, you know, nurses and healthcare providers in um, the hospital that I worked in. Um, and then that got added, I suppose, to the curriculum or the um, the training um, within the um, hospital and also within the uh, business as well, which was just really great to see that people were taking it seriously yeah. and people were benefiting from it. So we would talk about all the different skills and knowledge that we wanted to instill in people where whilst they gave and gave and gave in regards to the care and support and for other people they uh, sometimes neglected themselves so being able to increase people's self-compassion um, or uh, you know challenge some of their negative thinking um, or be able to um, put mindfulness techniques into practice say and then we started to deliver it to the new trainee nurses and I just loved it. Like I loved delivering the training. I loved um, reviewing it and, you know, growing it and, and being able to get the feedback that it was positive for people and seeing that people used to book themselves on the training, even though it wasn't their turn, they'd already done it. Oh, that's like, good. Yeah. Um, because they felt that after six months that, you know started to peter off and they were then starting to neglect themselves again right. so the idea of them those skills being refreshed um but that didn't take away from the fact that it was exceptionally challenging for people sure. working in that environment yeah um and for me as well and i think so you know talking about our own mental health journeys you know my anxiety started to increase um my you know, I started to overthink everything. I think that's because of the responsibility of the environment that you're working in, yep. where, you know, even to make sure that um, doors were locked or that, um, that people's care plans were signed and completed and all the things that ordinarily, yes, you do every single day. But when, you know, from my experience, I started to experience anxiety yeah. um, and then as we know then we can put ourselves in that threat mode where we worry about everything I think that I yeah started to do that because you know I cared so much and I think that that was the pattern that you yeah. cared so much about people you wanted people to um, progress um, and be okay and worrying that people weren't okay when you got home was you know, really challenging until you got in the next day yeah um so that you know as i've said that was a pattern for all of well not all but the majority yeah. of people were yep. in that service um and from you know i again i could alleviate that you know i, I have the the knowledge around that sometimes i think too much knowledge isn't the best when yeah, you're trying course, to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're not always good um, at taking your own advice though right no of course not no. and that's it, isn't it? Yeah. it's yeah. about yeah. Uh, re you know recharging thinking, right you know what kind of things would I be telling other people to do yeah and I just started yeah. to look after myself um you know the huge benefit of working in that environment was the shared experience that we all had yeah um, and also we were required to have supervision 
um, at which yeah. in part was talking about your caseload, yeah. but also in part was exploring your own mental health um, and how certain individuals affected your mental health um, because you had a connection with them um, or that you were really invested in their journey. And yeah. so that was, you know, again, a huge benefit. And I was able to manage that quite successfully until I had children. Right. Um, and I think for me, I think that was a big turning point um, in regards to where I am today, mm -hmm. that I had my first child whilst I was still completing my, um, my training. So my postgrad, my MSc, and yep. um, I was kind of taking statistics exams like when he was kind of five weeks old um I then went you know back to work after after you know having maternity leave um but within the environment that I worked not many people had children right. and I felt that not many people understood the impact of having a little person yeah, of um, yeah. being up all night uh, and then also having to work with trauma day in day right. out um, and that was, you know, that was a huge challenge. And again, with my first child, I could, I managed it quite well. Um, and then I had my second child and I was really quite poorly through that pregnancy. Um, and yeah, I wasn't getting this, the sleep. Um, my anxiety levels increased significantly when I returned back from um, maternity leave with him because be knowing to me like I had really low iron levels um and I wasn't sleeping you know as I said I wasn't sleeping well yeah and that coupled with the low iron levels which I think we dismiss I think sometimes and I bang on about this in every yeah. training course that I deliver yeah. and every talk I ever do the impact of vitamins and minerals for our mental health is so imperative okay. and I knew that before um, in regards to obviously my, my psychology training but until it happened to me I didn't realize this you know the significance of it in relation to you know my anxiety levels really increasing to the point of you know at times feeling quite paranoid yeah. um and I think Obviously, when we don't get enough sleep, that can, you know, impact on these, you know, bizarre thoughts that we yeah, might yeah. have as well. Um, and I remember having a couple of weeks off work because I just, I just couldn't sustain it. And having a conversation with my, you know, fantastic um, uh, supervisor at the time, and saying, I just don't know whether this is for me anymore. Um, I could continue doing what I'm doing and actually feeling quite poorly and then getting better for a little bit and then yeah. you know maybe feeling poorly again because yeah. I'm still going to have children and they're still going to take up a lot of my time um and sleep probably isn't going to be great for quite a long time yeah. <laughs> um and my priorities have changed yeah of course initially I was very career driven and I was all about you know getting this to the top of my game and getting the best results I could on my exams and being a perfectionist and having these unrelenting standards of being the best that I could possibly be um, and I talk about sustainability a lot I couldn't sustain that long term particularly when you, know, you can't expect to be a perfect parent and a perfect psychologist and a perfect colleague and a perfect partner and that was my my challenge um, in regards to my own mental health and being able to say it out loud and say I don't think that I can do this right now I'm not saying I'm never going to do it I'm not saying that I'm never going to come back and no. work in this environment again um was really difficult because there was that push me pull you didn't yeah, want to feel like a failure <laughs> yeah. um but then I sat back and I reflected on how incredible I felt delivering the training so the resilience training for yeah. the the um, nurses and healthcare workers and I thought what if that could be my main role um so 
I sat down, I planned and I looked at stuff and I looked at how flexible that would be if I were independent and yeah. how that would really kind of fit in with my life and fit in with, um, you know, childcare. And I took the plunge really. So I started to deliver the resilience training in um, kind of in the NHS sector um, and also private healthcare. So I started to deliver that, um, you know, being self-employed and yeah. doing it on my own. And then it just grew. So then I started to be asked to come and do talks for people or, you know, do, um, you know, a lecture or, and then corporate started to contact me and say, can you come and do a talk? And then I saw this mental health first aid um, and thought, oh, well that, you know, that would be really kind of good to yeah. add on to the, um, the training regime. And I could hopefully offer all of that, you know, knowledge and skills that I had, but also all of the journeys of the people that I've worked with again, confidentially yeah. so that it could yeah. be real for the people who are attending these training sessions and um, so you know people could understand the gravity um and also the whole wealth of difference in regards to yeah. mental health um, and that kind of took me on kind of my business journey as it is now yeah um and you know as I said, what a big thing for me is still supporting people within the healthcare sector sure, yeah. because I've been there yeah. and I've been part of that world yeah. and I know the impact that it can have on people's mental health mm. where they are so brilliant and wonderful at looking after other people's mental health um, but not so much themselves and really being that yeah. reminder um, to people and to continue to do that because yeah. of the importance of themselves and also the people that they support. You know, we know, yeah. don't we? We can't provide care if we're you know, supporting people from an empty cup. Exactly. Um, uh, Brilliant. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a bit of a whistle stop tour, really. <laughs> well, that's the longest introduction I've ever had um, from somebody. <laughs> Is the introduction, story, and close all in one? We are literally <laughs> like right at the end of half an hour, nearly. You know, it's incredible. Honestly, I've I've found it so fascinating. Your experiences, the the journey that you've been on, the inside knowledge that you've shared with people around, sort of, you know, in those inpatient settings. And oh, there's a million questions I want to ask you, but you know, obviously, we're limited by this time thing of this uh, recording unfortunately but it is such an important conversation and, and your awareness your knowledge your understanding your experiences are so so valuable um you know which is why obviously you are successful in what you're doing and and you know sharing that and having that ability just to say look it's not all great it's you know there are challenges here it's you know just because you've got a a, you know a title of psychologist or a you know a, or whatever the role is that you're performing doesn't mean that you also don't feel you know, you, you also feel some of those struggles. Um, so what I'm going to do, as I always do, is I'm just going to give you the floor for the last minute or so, just if there's anything else you want to say in terms of sort of thoughts for, you know, words of wisdom, thoughts for the future, anything like that. I will drop all of your contact details into the post as well. So people will be able to find you, Amy, as well. Um, but any final thoughts, throwing it over to you. Um, I feel like I've spoken for so long. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. I've literally just sat here and drank my water and enjoyed it. It's been I'm lovely. like, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to do this for half an hour. And then we're like, well, it's bang on half an hour, Amy. Fascinating, um, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's that if you are ever in that place where you you know, are experiencing depression or anxiety or psychosis whatever that might be for you yeah that it's not it's not going to last forever and I absolutely have hope for recovery and I've seen people who have been exceptionally poorly for a very very long time and that have got to the point where they still have that diagnosis you know they still have depression or anxiety but they manage it so much better 
with this holistic support and I think that that's so important it's about what can you know you have holistically around yourself that's going to support you with your mental health or what can we provide as mental health professionals colleagues friends yeah. to be part of that person's um you know holistic wraparound support and care and um, because they'll get there yeah. um but it will take time and you or they um will be okay but it will take time yeah. and yeah and i think that that's it when i was talking about armor earlier it's about how we can support people to de-armor um and feel safe to do that and yeah. yeah that's only going to take time if they spent so many years at armor and it's worked for them yeah definitely taking time at de-armoring safe spaces all very relevant to these conversations of mental health um Amy, thank you so much. I really do genuinely appreciate you spending time just to chat and just share a bit of your story and your journey and, and everything else. Um, as I always do at the end of this, just if you are struggling, if you do need extra help or support, and if you know anything that Amy's been talking about has sort of brought some thoughts up or some worries, concerns or anything, please do know you can always reach out to either one of us um, to talk about those, of course. Um, there are safe spaces out there as well and available with organisations like Samaritans. So do know that you can contact Samaritans and just talk to the to a wonderful listening volunteer um, who just listens, who doesn't judge, um, but will just give you some support to be able to offload some of those thoughts. So Samaritans, you can call on 116-123. Um, you can also text shell 85258 if you wanted to uh, use text, if you prefer that. Um, but always know there is somebody out there. Please don't sit there with these thoughts alone. It is very dangerous if we sit and we don't do anything. If we don't act on these, you know, the, the, on getting support for these thoughts, of course. Um, so that's it. So Amy, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to get to, to hear your story. I really do appreciate your time as well. You're welcome, no worries. Take care. Thank you.